so good evening good morning and hello to everyone welcome to a bombay management associations master class uh, we must thank uh, pandemic 19 as we have become more and more innovative and we have got a a series of lectures which otherwise would not have been possible online not only the professors who are taking master classes but also the timings with which we have innovated i think uh, we, we are enjoying all these innovations today at your dinner table maybe we are going to have a very interesting session on building a customer centric organization by professor rohit deshpande i must welcome you all professor rohit deshpande all the past presidents of bombay management association my colleagues from academia uh, guru nanak institute of management studies who is collaborating for this particular event all the members of bombay management association students fraternity from all over the state i am very happy to welcome you all to this bma master class this is the seventh master class in the series we had none other than uh, prasanna chandra professor prasanna chandra inaugurating this bombay management association master class bma master class we had professor kevin keller we had professor dr pramath raj sena and also we had professor kotler for these master classes and today we have with us professor rohit deshpande from harvard business school as the slide in front of us it's same saying that he is alumnus of jbims of batch 1973 i welcome you all and request our honorary treasurer dr kiran yadav to do the honors over to you kiran sir uh he has to be anting unmuted uh Mm. Oh, Amy, can you unmute? Yes, yes. I have asked him to unmute. He can unmute. Yeah. Kiran sir, can you? Okay. Can you yeah. hear me now? Yes. Yes. Oh, thank, you. thank you. Thank uh, you. Good evening, everybody. and uh, i know it's late in the evening but i'm sure we are going to have a nice late evening today mm -hmm. so before we start i would request uh, uh, hoimi to play the video which has been sent to us by our uh, uh, host for tonight uh, the gnms business school hoimi can you quickly play that video
uh, thanks Oemi for that. Uh, may I now request uh, Dr. D.Y. Patil, the group director of GNIMS to make uh, his introductory remarks. Uh, Oemi, can you unmute him? Sir, you can unmute yourself. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. Yeah. Good yes, evening. you are audible, sir. Uh, it is indeed an honor and privilege to bring to you this session of Professor Dr. Rohit Deshpande of Harvard Business School. We at GNIMS are proud to be an active member of BMA and associated with creditable work it does in enhancing management education. I welcome all the BMA members and students to this masterclass on behalf of Guru Nanak Institute of Management Studies. Looking forward to a great learning session from Dr. Rohit Deshpande. Thank you. Uh, everyone, uh, sorry. Thank you, sir, uh, Dr. Rohit Deshpande for accepting our invitation. Thank you, Dr. Kavita Lagate, President BMA, for offering us to host this session. My personal greetings to all the senior members of BMA and uh, ex-presidents, office bearers, and members, and our dear students. Guru Nanak Institute of Management Studies will continue to support BMA in future for such exemplary efforts. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Patel. Uh, before uh, I get on to my pleasant job of introducing uh, Dr. Rohit Deshpande, I just want to urge everybody to understand. Uh, thank you for being here today. And you know that BMA has been consistently bringing you some ex very good quality uh, sessions. And uh, they have benefited most of you in a different ways. So I would also urge you to seriously uh, become a member of BMA if you haven't done so already by now. Uh, that brings me to the proud privilege of trying to introduce Dr. Deshpande. As all of us know, Dr. Deshpande is the Sebastian Kresge Professor of Marketing at Harvard Business School, where he has been teaching advanced management program, program for leadership development, owner president management program and other executive offerings. He has also taught global branding, international marketing, first year MBA programs as well as doctoral seminars in marketing. He is a faculty chair of the global colloquium for participant centered learning, strategic marketing management executive program at Harvard Business School. He was a part of the design and delivery of the leadership corporate accountability program, which now is a requirement at Harvard Business School as a core basic. In 2008-09, uh, Dr. Deshpande was recognized as the Henry B. Arthur Fellow for Business Ethics. In 2015, he received the Robert F. Greenhill Award for outstanding contribution to Harvard business school community and he won the silver tele awards for case studies on Winton, Marcellus and Zaz at Lincoln Center and Street Symphony. In 2021, he's won the Journal of Consumer Psychology Park Best Paper Award for his co-authored paper Consumers avoid buying from firms with higher CEO to worker pay ratios. Roy Deshpande was the first one to coin and introduce the word consumer centricity way back in 1998 at the American Marketing Association's meet, well before it became a strategic focus worldwide. He has published series of research papers on customer centric companies in Asia, Europe and America and was cited by AMA 
as one of the most highly published full professors in the marketing field. His recent work on the topics in core uh, readings in uh, marketing series on customer centricity have been published as a book. He is now extending customer centricity into audience engagement in arts and culture organizations with case studies on marketing of museums, theater and classical music. He has served on the editorial boards of various international journals, Journal of Marketing, Journal of Marketing Research, Journal of International Marketing, Journal of Business Research and the Asian Journal of Marketing. He is on, on the Executive Director Council of the Marketing Science Institute and on the board of AMA. Mr. Deshpande has consulted with and taught executive seminars in the US, Europe and Asia. At Harvard, he serves on various boards, the Harvard University Committee of, on Arts, Harvard Initiative for Learning and Teaching, Harvard Murthy Classical Library of India. He has also been on the boards of the American Repertory Theater and the Silk Road Organization founded by Yo-Yo Ma. Before Harvard Business School, Dr. Rohit Deshpande was the E.B. Osborne Professor of Marketing at Amos Tuck School of Business Administration at Dartmouth College. Before that, he was the Associate and Assistant Professor at the University of Texas, Austin, Visiting Professor at the Graduate School of Business, Stanford University, and Thomas Henry Carroll Ford Foundation. He has a BSc Honours with Distinction and a Master of Management Studies from the University of Mumbai, an MMM, sorry, an MM from the Northwestern University and a PhD from the University of Pittsburgh, where he received the Distinguished Alumnus Award in 2008. Today, Dr. Deshpande is here to talk about how to build consumer-centric organizations. Dr. Deshpande, the floor is all yours for your initial remarks and address. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you, Mr. Over Yadav. Th thank you, Professor Lagarde. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, and I thank all of you uh, who are attending for making time for this very late in your day. I don't know whether I'm coming between uh, before or after your dinner. If it's before your dinner, this is going to be quite complicated uh, to keep you entertained. Uh, but, uh, but thank you again. Okay, I'm going to try to uh, screen share here again and uh, see whether we can get this. Um, so hopefully you can see the screen. Um, great, thank you. Uh, so uh, I have made this um, interactive. I've built in questions in here. Um, so if you could type your responses into the chat box as we go along, uh, that'll be really great. Okay. So um, as uh, Professor Lagarde mentioned, I'm a, a very proud alumnus uh, of her institute. Uh, of the Bajaj Institute, um, going back a, a long, long, long way. And um, I'm very happy to see members of my batch who are uh, attending as well. So, uh, and, and, and senior, uh, Ravi, uh, you were a senior, so were you, Sheila, uh, and I see Parag here. So, so thank you, uh, good friends. Okay. Let me jump right into the uh, into the presentation. So, um, so this is a quick outline of what I'm going to do. Cover the agenda. Um, I'm going to start with a couple of definitions. Uh, as uh, as uh, um, uh, Mr. Yadav mentioned, I uh, coined this term, uh, customer centricity, uh, thirty something years ago, 
and I'll give you a, uh, some definitions of, of, of what it is that uh, we mean by customer centricity. Then I'm going to go right into a, a research program that some colleagues and I have been conducting uh, on customer centricity and global branding uh, to give you some empirical data, some evidence, some science behind uh, what it is that we're talking about. Um, I'm going to emphasize uh, something called customer insights. I'm going to give you a framework for thinking about customer insights uh, then end with a framework on culture, strategy, and execution, um, as is our uh, as is our predilection throughout. Uh, I'll be using case study examples, as you probably know. At Harvard Business School, our primary pedagogy is is case studies uh, about companies, and so I'm going to use a lot of case studies. They're pretty much all case studies that I've developed. Um, so I hope that will keep it interesting. It won't be very abstract. It'll be, I think, very uh, very practical. Uh, for those of you practitioners who are in the audience, hopefully you will get uh, two or three ideas that you can implement right away. So let me uh, let me start now. Um, so let me start with uh, something that Bill Gates said when he was CEO of Microsoft. He said, successful companies succeed because they've got a long-term approach in dealing with employees and dealing with customers. And this is the key part I want to emphasize. People buy products because of their relationship with the company that makes them. Now, the distinction here that's very important for us to understand is that he's not talking about people buy products because of the technical attributes of the product. Keep in mind that they're making software, right? Uh, he said because of the relationship with the company that makes them. This is going to come back in the definition a little later on. I've done a lot of work in this area. Uh, we used to call it market orientation. I've written books in this, on this uh, particular topic. And then I realized when I was giving talks to people like you, practitioners, that they thought when I was talking about market orientation, they meant marketing. And I said, no, no, this is not marketing. This is about the entire firm. So I changed it and I called it customer centricity because this is something that actually affects the entire organization, not just sales and marketing. And I'm going to explain in more detail as we go along. So here's the definition that we use. Customer centricity is the set of beliefs that puts the customer's interest first while not excluding those of other stakeholders in order to develop a long-term profitable enterprise. So three components that I've underlined here. First, fundamentally, this is a corporate culture. It's a kind of corporate culture. That's why it's a set of beliefs. It's not only strategies. It's not only execution. It's fundamentally culture that we're going to talk about today. Second, it's not like we exclude other stakeholders, other stakeholders, employees, investors, government, society are all important. But what we're saying is the customer's interest should come first. And I'll explain why in just a moment. And this is not for a short term gain. It takes investment in customer centricity before you turn a profit. And so this is about long term profitability, not about short term gain. Okay, so these are the three components. Now, uh, let me quote something that Peter Drucker wrote. Uh, Peter Drucker, as you might know, all of you know, but Peter Drucker is, was um, uh, esteemed uh, scholar, uh, management consultant, writer, has published more articles in Harvard Business Review than anybody else. The late Peter Drucker wrote, Marketing is the whole business seen from the point of view of its final result. That is from the customer's point of view. There's only one valid definition of business purpose. And I love this phrase, to create a customer. He doesn't say to satisfy a customer. He says to create a customer. He's thinking aspirational. It is a customer who determines what a business is. Now, to me, what is curious about this is not that it's not intuitive. This is very intuitive, right? This makes a lot of sense to us. It makes a lot of sense. What is Curious about this is when Professor Drucker wrote this. This was published in a book called Practice of Management back in 1954. So the curiosity is that the stuff I'm going to talk about now is not brain science, rocket science. It's not new. It's been around for a really long time. The question you have to ask yourselves is, if this, is, if this has been around for such a long time, why isn't every company doing it? Why aren't all companies doing it? So I'm going to talk not only about the facilitators of customer orientation, but the barriers to customer orientation. So we're going to look at both sides of the coin. All right. So my work has been in international marketing strategy. I've been most interested in problems that happen across borders, across ages, countries, regions, et cetera. 
And a few years ago, a couple of colleagues and I did a, uh, a major research project. We were interested in identifying high performance firms. That is globally, the companies that outperform all other firms in their sector. So we started with the sort of the most uh, industrialized um, uh, countries at the time, the, what we used to call the triad, England, France, Germany, Japan, and the US. We interviewed 600 senior managers in large firms. These are all publicly quoted. So we had financial data over time for, for these companies. They were quoted on in Japan on Nikkei, in France on Boers, et cetera. Uh, and these were all leaders in their sectors. So there were market leaders in their sectors, both B2B as well as B2C. We looked at retail, we looked at manufacturing, low tech, high tech, et cetera. And we interviewed both people in the company. And then we asked them to give us the contacts of their major customers or clients. And we interviewed the clients about the supplier company. Then we replicated the study for the largest companies in what we used to call BRIC, Brazil, Russia, India, and China. Now keep in mind one distinction. We're still looking for the largest companies, the most successful companies, but of course in certain countries like in China and Russia, these were SOEs, state-owned enterprises, right? So, so keep, keep that in mind, there's, some, there's a little bit of difference here. Let me go to the bottom line. What did we find? What we found, this was very, this was very strange to us. We expected differences and instead we found commonalities. We found that there was no difference in quote, the success profile by country, industry, or other demographic. In other words, the most successful firms have the same successful profile as the most successful Brazilian, Chinese, Indian, Russian firms. Now, the, keep in mind the caveat here, the average Indian firm looks very different from the average American firm and very different from the average Brazilian firm. But the top quartile Indian companies look identical to the top quartile of American companies. That's what we call success profile. Of course, at this point, you're saying, so what is this success profile? So let me show you. Here, four points. Four points. This is, this is the bottom line of the research that we found. And I'm going to come back to each of these examples. Let me just overview them. The first one is obvious. I wouldn't be talking about customer centricity otherwise. They are customer centric rather than product or technology centric. Even if they are technology leaders within their sectors, what distinguishes them is not the technology. What distinguishes them is customer centricity. Second, they outcompete other firms in terms of their investment in deep customer insights. I'm going to come back to this. These people invest in research on customers, out invest others in their sector. Third, this also we didn't realize before going to the study, they have integrated branding with customer centricity. They don't handle branding as a separate component run by a branding function or a marketing or a sales function. Somehow it's integrated with customer centricity at the top of the organization. And fourth, this is also quite amazing. It's not just the employees who are customer facing who get rewarded for customer focused innovation. It's any employee. You could come from finance or accounting or R&D and you will be rewarded, which means as the sub bullets point say at the bottom, they tend to be flat organizations. They tend to be decentralized organizations. They're entrepreneurial. We, the term we used to use is entrepreneurial. That means they're entrepreneurial inside large organizations and they encourage in all employee participation in delighting customers, okay? So this is basically the success profile that we found characterizes the top companies across all of these different uh, companies that we looked at, all these different industries we looked at. Now I'm going to go into examples for each one of these four points. So it's not theoretical, it becomes more uh, practical. So let's start. Importance of customer insights. So one of the things we found is customer-centric firms know more about their customers, have deeper insights than their competition. Let me give you one example of this, okay? So many of you are familiar with this particular product, Corona beer, right? It's a very, very popular beer. It comes from Mexico. This is a very typical ad. Now I want you to type into chat what you think the insight is that drove the creative for this ad. Okay, let's get somebody started on this. Okay, what is the, I said that customer insights are really important. What is? What do you think is the customer insight that's going into this? 
Okay, who's going to start? Type it into chat. Holiday, very good. Uday, relax while drinking, excellent. Uh, extra, people have beer on vacation, refreshing. Okay, good times, beer at the beach. Okay, all right, wonderful. All right, now let me tell you what the insight is. This is, I'm interviewing their senior manager, the president of the company. I'm in Mexico City, okay? And exactly what you wrote, I had thought. This is what he tells me. He says, actually, the insight is the ritual of the lime. Did you see there was a little, like a limbu lime stuck in the top? So here's the backstory. These guys are the number one brand in Mexico. They basically market saturated Mexico with beer. So they have to go to the largest market in the world, beverage market, which is north of the border, which is the US. They come to the US and they are selling mostly in the border states. The border states would be like California, Texas, bordering Mexico. And they notice that the young people who are buying their beer, they are telling the bar bartender or the waiter, whoever it is, to put a little wedge of lime into the bottle and serve it to them. And then they squeeze little lime into it, they drive the lime into it, they drink it, ha ha, they're very happy. So first, when they saw this, the managers of the company, the head of the company hated it. Two reasons. First, they said, what is the flavor of our beer not good enough that these Americans have to squeeze uh, limbo, lime into it? You know, what it is very you know, it is, it's embarrassing for us. Second reason they didn't like it is they recycle the bottles. They recycle the bottle. So just imagine in the supply chain, your cost is going up because you've got to take this dried wedge of lime out and recycle, wash the bottle, et cetera. So they didn't like it. Now, they had on uh, site a consultant, an anthropologist consultant, and the anthropologist said, this is a ritual. This is a consumer ritual. The consumer is owning the ritual. It's coming from them. It's not coming from you. Don't get rid of it. So in fact, they embraced it. They made it part of their advertising. All of their advertising shows that wedge of lime. They make like a little visual pun of something like this. And this has become the most successful imported beer in the world. Every country in which they are exporting to, they have moved into the number one position for imported beer. So it's, it's an amazing story. So that's an example of customer insight, something that originates from the customer that the company had not thought of that gives the customer pleasure that you then incorporate into your strategy. Now, let me give you a framework for thinking about this. So um, a, a, a line, a two lines of poetry that I love from one of my favorite poets, uh, second favorite poet, my favorite poet is my son, Jay. Second favorite poet is T.S. Eliot, uh, uh, Nobel laureate in, in literature. He wrote in this poem called The Rock, where is the wisdom we have lost in knowledge? Where is the knowledge we have lost in information? Now I'm kind of a self-professed geek. When I looked at this, to me, they said, you know what? I see in this a causality. Three words, wisdom, knowledge, information. There's a causality here. So I was in a restaurant. I drew on the back of a napkin. And this is a diagram that I drew. Data to information, to knowledge, to wisdom. Let me explain this to you. This is customer insights. We start with an overload of data. We are talking about big data, big data all the time. We have too much data. So to me, that's an example of no wisdom, just too much data. We have to convert that data into information. We have to convert the information to knowledge. We have to convert the knowledge into wisdom before we actually have insight. So if data is what, like what is being purchased of our products, customer information is who is purchasing the what, knowledge is why is the who purchasing the what, and wisdom is how are they actually using the product and how have they integrated it into their lives and lifestyles? So we can't just end with big data. We've got to move data through information to knowledge to wisdom. So this is the conceptual framework I'd like you to keep in mind. And now let me give you examples of how these companies that we were studying, case examples of how these companies that we're studying have actually done this, how they've integrated this framework, okay? So let's give you one, another result from our research study. Customer-centric firms know how to use customer insights to outcompete in serving, not just customer satisfaction, customer delight, okay? So let me give you an example now. So I give you an example from uh, packaged goods, uh, which is the beer example from Corona. 
uh, from Mexico. Let me give you another example, but from airline industry. So this is from service business and from a different country, Singapore. The example is of Singapore Airlines. Now, you may or may not know that uh, the majority of airlines that are in the long haul business, that means they're operating across long distances across countries, lose money. In fact, they lose so much money that many of them have been bailed out by their governments. The British government has bailed out British Airways, for example. German government has bailed out Lufthansa, for example. US government has bailed out pretty much all of the US airlines like America and United, for example. One company has consistently made a profit that's Singapore Airlines. So here's an example of a, uh, an ad of theirs, uh, of their first class cabin, okay? And here's an example of an ad of theirs from their uh, business class cabin, new business class cabin. Now, I want you to put into chat what, same question as I asked with Corona beer, what do you think is the customer insight behind the Singapore Airlines ads? What is the customer insight? Relaxing on travel, make them feel like home, personalized touch, comfort, luxury, change. Okay, great. Homely touch. Okay, now let me let me tell you what they I'll, I'll tell you the insight and then I'll explain it. Okay. So here's the here's the insight. Insight is we compete with software, not just hardware. Okay. So let me go back to this ad here. Okay, business class cabin. So the CEO, I'm interviewing the chairman of the company and what he's saying is, Professor, you know, uh, all the major airlines can afford basically the same seats because there's two manufacturers in Switzerland that make these things. All major airlines can afford those uh, in-flight entertainment systems. There are five manufacturers across the world that make them, everybody's buying from them. All airlines can afford, not all, but the major ones, can afford the, the uh, aircraft that you see because there are only two companies, Boeing and Airbus, that are making these kinds of things, right? Uh, all airlines can afford the, uh, the chefs that create these things, right? So we all have to invest in hardware. We all have to buy the same airplanes. We all have to buy the same seats, et cetera. We all, that's hardware. We have to invest in hardware. What distinguishes us is software. It's the training that we give our people our in-flight people and our ground staff people, they are trained at such a superb level that nobody else can compete. So what these folks do is they spend so much time on training their in-flight crew. And uh, the, this person was telling me, he said, you know, at 30,000 feet, if there's a crisis, we wanna make sure that our staff is completely trained to handle, handle that crisis. So therefore the insight is, it's not just hardware. We have to invest in the hardware, but we actually compete with software. Okay, so in fact, many of their ads don't even show airplanes. This is very interesting. They show the staff. Okay, now let me give you another example. I don't know how many of you here uh, like chocolate. I am a chocoholic. I love chocolate. So I don't know how many of you, those of you like me who like chocolate, have ever heard of this brand, Chocolatus El Rey. I would say very few of you have heard of this brand. Let me tell you a little bit about this brand. This brand is from Venezuela. It turns out that Venezuela makes the best chocolate in the world. Their chocolate is so good that Venezuelan cacao chocolate commands a 35% price premium over chocolate from any other origin in the world. 35%. It's so good. The quality of the chocolate is so good. But then you're saying, how come I've never heard of this? In fact, when I ask people, where does the best chocolate come from? Nobody says Venezuela. What do they say? Switzerland. Or they say Belgium. Now think about it. Chocolate cannot grow in Switzerland. Chocolate cannot grow in Belgium. It can only grow in the tropics. That means Switzerland, like, mm, you know, uh, Lint from Switzerland or maybe... Uh, Godiva from Belgium, they're basically buying, they're sourcing, they're packaging, they're marketing and branding it. 
And that's why we think the best chocolate comes from Switzerland. It does not come from Switzerland. It comes from other countries and the very best comes from here. Now, why does nobody know about this? The reason is because they focus on product quality. Every year they produce better and better product quality. But they have not invested in customers. They have not invested in marketing. Nobody knows their name. So this is what I call the better mousetrap fallacy. You know the better mousetrap? The proverb is, you build a better mousetrap and the world will beat a path to your door, right? What if the world owns a cat? They don't need a better mousetrap. They've got a cat, the cat will trap all the mice. Huh? So improving your product quality is not enough. That's what we call product centricity. Until you're customer centric, you're not gonna capture that, 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 that market. Here's another, here's another uh, result from my research. Remember I said, customer-centric firms know how to motivate all employees to produce customer-focused innovation. Let me go to another country with another example case study. The country is Japan, the product is soy sauce, and the brand is Kikoman. Okay, so many of you are familiar with Kikoman. Kikoman is the brand leader, has been for the long, longest time, uh, soy sauce in Japan. Same thing, market is penetrated as soy sauce, They've got to grow somewhere. They decide to come to the US. They set up in San Francisco, as a lot of Japanese companies do. They come to the West Coast of the US and they start to sell there and they do miserably. Nobody's buying their stuff. So let me show you an ad that they used. They, they're going direct to, to consumer with their advertising. So here's, here's a classic ad that they used. Okay. Now I want you to type into chat why this doesn't work. Forget about, forget about the text at the bottom. Just look at the picture and tell me why this thing bombed. Why did it not work? It doesn't look appetizing. Yeah, why not? Black and white photo not appealing. Yeah, that's, that's true. Looks gooey, okay. Not work, doesn't work with steak, the brush, yeah. Right, okay, good, okay. All right, so here's the thing. There are many, many things that are wrong with this picture, right? So first, first, you know, in the US, uh, this barbecuing, it tends to be a male dominated activity. It's one of the few things that men cook in the US, right? They take pride in going to an outdoor grill and actually cooking. Here they're showing a woman's hand, right? It's like, that doesn't make sense. And then why soy sauce on a burger doesn't make sense. So these guys said, you know what, we're going to send a cross-functional team of managers from Japan, from Tokyo, to the US, and they're not going to talk to anyone, they're simply going to observe. So they sent them to supermarkets, and the largest chain of supermarkets is from, from uh, California, it's a company called Safeway. So they went into Safeway, and they stood in the aisle where they sell this soy sauce, and they observed, they took notes. And then they went back to Tokyo and they filed a report. And basically the report said, we have two conclusions. First is very few Americans go into the aisle where soy sauce is being sold. It's called the international foods or ethnic foods aisle. And very few people go into that aisle. There's another aisle in which sauces are sold where a lot of Americans are going. And that one is where they have like ketchups and sauces and all of that, a lot of people. So they came back and they said, you know what? We've got to come up with a new product. The new product we will market not as a soy sauce, but as a marinade. So they came up with this product. They in fact invented this category. It's called teriyaki. And notice the text here, it doesn't say soy sauce. It's called marinade and sauce. And the chairman of the company, he's telling me, he said, Professor, <clears throat> you know, what we discovered was that people take a bowl, men, American men, they take a bowl, they put a large quantity of meat into it, which we can't afford in Japan because meat is very expensive. They put a large quantity of meat in, then they'll take one of our bottles of teriyaki, they'll open it, and they'll pour the entire thing into that bowl. They leave it in the fridge overnight to marinate, they'll take it out the next day, they pour out all of the teriyaki into the sink and they will go and grill it. He said, our volume went like that because we sold so much of this stuff. Now, the curious thing is, this is essentially 95% soy sauce with a different flavoring agent. 
So it's the same thing, but they've repositioned it. It is no longer being soy sauce. It is now a marinade. So basically, the customer insight is adapt to local consumption habits rather than force feed foreign habits. Right? Rather than trying to sell soy sauce the way it's sold in Japan, go and understand, observe. You don't even have to talk to people. Observe how they are buying and how they're using. Come back, new product. And this comes from a cross-functional team. Right? So this is not just the marketing people who come up with this idea. <clears throat> okay, so basically now they've got these, you know, teriyaki has become a very, very successful product category. Now, let me say something about branding. Remember one of the results of the, of the, of the research was uh, this branding. Customer-centric firms know how to integrate branding into overall corporate strategy. The question is why? We discovered four reasons, relevance, distinctiveness, ubiquity, and consistency. And let me very quickly give you four examples that you know well. So Nike is not in the business of selling footwear or athletic clothing. Nike is in the business for themselves. They're in the business of consumer aspirations, customer hopes. Their biggest category is what they call weekend athletes. People who think of themselves as athletes on the weekend or, or, or being very athletic, those are the people they want to target. So they make their product relevant by not selling shoes, but by selling authenticity. Distinctiveness. Disney has made a lot of money from their Disneyland and Disney World theme parks. One of the things that they realize is that people are in very long lines to get to the particular <clears throat> rides that they want to go on. So they have come up with a system where they tell you if you're going to book a trip with your family to a park, you can get a little band, a wristband. That wristband is actually pre-programmed with who in your family is coming, which rides they want to go to, what foods they're allergic to, what foods they... So the moment you walk through the gate, it reads the bands and it tracks and it knows exactly who is coming. So they're reducing the lines. It's a unique brand experience, a distinctive. Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola is not about carbonated beverages. When I was in Atlanta at Coke, the, their strategy is within arm's length of desire. Within arm's length of desire. Anywhere where somebody is thirsty, they want Coke accessible, everywhere accessible. And that's what drove Coca-Cola into the vending business. Because in a lot of places, just think about it in India, in the rural sector, you don't have these cold storage things. So vending machines. And finally, IBM. IBM realized that people are not interested in these machines and technology and so on. They want to have a clear, consistent voice and that's about solving the world's problems. So a lot of people today don't even know what IBM stands for. It stands for International Business Machines. They changed it. They don't say that anymore. It's IBM. In fact, their greatest profitability comes from technology solutions and not from hardware. So relevance, distinctiveness, ubiquity, and consistency is what distinguishes these, the branding. And that's why it's, it's, it's all customer-centric. Each of these points here is really customer-centric. So let me summarize this. Branding provides an inside-outside connection. It's the face, your, your brand is the face of your company to the customer. So you have to sell your brand inside to your employees. They have to understand the meaning of your brand before you can sell it outside. Branding is more than a logo. It's about an emotional customer-centric connection between customers and employees. The face of your brand, it's your connection, emotional, which means the final bullet point here, it's a relationship. A brand is symptomatic of the relationship that your company has with your customers. And it's a promise that you make to your customers about what they should expect from your brand. So brand is absolutely customer said. This is really what, 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 what branding is about. So let me give you a picture of thinking about this. Start from the right-hand side. What I just talked about is a brand is more than something that the marketing people do. It's really a way to align the entire organization. 
operations, HR, marketing, all, all of the functions. I just put three in here. But it's branding is something that puts the entire organization together. And let's go to the left-hand side. This is where I want to go now. Customer centricity. So remember at the beginning of the talk, I said that customer centricity is more than tactics. It's more than your execution. It's even more than your strategy. Fund fundamentally, it's about culture. So I'm going to go to that left-hand triangle in just a moment, but just keep this diagram in mind. It's really customer centricity and branding are connected in these companies, these top global performer companies that I, I studied, that we studied, okay? So this is what I just said. Customer centricity is not only strategy and tactics, but culture. Execution is go-to-market solutions and processes. As we know, strategy is developing a value proposition and competitive positioning based on customer needs. Uh, culture, I'm going to say a lot more about this, is being an advocate for the customer throughout the organization. That's customer centricity. Who speaks for the customer in your organization? Who speaks? Who is the conscience of the customer in your firm? That's customer centricity. So what are the implications? It's customer centricity is not something you do to your customer. It's how the customer gets to influence you. It's how the customer gets to influence you. You know, on Amazon, they have in their conference rooms, they have, whenever they have a meeting, they have one chair that's empty always, one chair that's empty. And that chair is supposed to represent the voice of the customer. So that for every meeting, they are mindful of the fact that we have to pay attention to the customer. What would the customer say? It's how the customer gets to influence your company. So as I was saying at the beginning, it's really about culture. So these are quotes from some of these top executives that we interviewed that talk about what a customer-centric culture means to them in their firms. And in red, in the parenthesis, are uh, their initiatives around customer centricity. The customer's interest should always come first ahead of the owner's. So this particular company that we studied calls that prioritize our stakeholders. Not that other stakeholders are not important, but we want to prioritize our stakeholders. So in fact, this is very interesting. We found this in a number of, number of companies. <clears throat> they consider profit to be an outcome, not a goal. Let me repeat, it's a very important point. They consider profit to be an outcome and not a goal. What this means is that you don't focus on delivering profits quarter by quarter by quarter because frequently you do that by cutting on customer investments. They think that if you prioritize customers, customers' interest, you will naturally be profitable. But profit is an outcome. Second, I believe this business exists primarily to serve customers. The, uh, this is a company that has an initiative called Customer Number One. Customer Number One. Uh, third, we have a good sense of how our customers view our products and services. This is that whole thing I went into, which is the deep customer insights. Um, so these are companies that, some of these companies have hired people from competitors and they've discovered that they know far more about their customers than the competition does. And they pride themselves on that, that they do a better, it's, it's, it's a competitive advantage for them uh, to be invested in, in, in customer insights. Okay, so let me go on. So let me, let me um, and we're coming to the end of our time here. So let me uh, have some summary learning principles. And then uh, if we've got a few minutes, we can take some questions. So the first learning principle is innovate around your customers, not just around your products. Innovate around your customers, not just around your products. <clears throat> so what, what do I mean by this? The flip side of a customer pain point is an idea for an innovative solution. So, you know, when customers complain, a lot of people say, oh, these customers, you know, they are complaining. The, these, these very smart companies, highly profitable companies that we studied, actually look at it another way. They say, if the customer is complaining, maybe they're giving us an idea for an innovative solution. So rather than saying, oh God, we'll fix the problem. Let's just think, can we come up with a new program? Can we come up with a new idea? Can we come up with a new, new product or a new service? Okay. Key learning principle number two, 
view your customers as strategic assets. They help you define your business and identify new business opportunities. You know, for most of us, we think of strategic assets in terms of our employees, in terms of our factories, manufacturing, et cetera. We don't think of our customers as strategic assets, but our best customers help us. I won't go through all of these, but they ask you to do things you can do well. They make demands that challenge you. They take you in directions consistent with the strategy. Start thinking about your customers as assets. Learning principle number three, stay loyal to your loyals. So, you know, this uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, Professor Lagate was saying earlier, you were talking about the pandemic. Uh, there's some interesting research, Professor Lagate, that was done um, before the GFC, the global financial crisis, right? Then 2008, 2009, uh, what these people did was uh, they studied companies that had not invested in their customers during the crisis, which is the majority of customers, the majority of companies. Because the first thing you do when you have an economic crisis, you cut back on customer investment, right? Cut back on your sales effort, you cut out all your advertising, right? All of that stuff. They studied those companies and this versus the companies that actually continued to invest in customers during the global financial crisis. And what they found is the companies that continued to invest in their customers gained market share after the global financial crisis was over. And I'm predicting the same thing is going to happen with this pandemic. That the companies that have invested, you know, the company, Mahindra is an example in India, right? Tata is an example in India, right? The, these are companies that haven't cut back their investing. My prediction is that these companies are going to gain market share. Why is that? Because customers are saying, you know, when times were hard, you stayed with me. You stuck with me. You were loyal to me. And so I will give you more business now that the pandemic is over. I will give you more business now that the global financial. So key learning principle number three, stay loyal to your loyals. And key learning principle number four, marketing is everybody's job, especially the top leadership. Customer centricity is everybody's job, especially the top leadership. If the top leadership does not walk the talk, you can't expect a middle level or a junior level employee to do it. They'll say, I'm not being rewarded for this. I don't see the MD or the chairman doing this, why should, they are not customer centric, why should I expect? So I drew a little diagram and this is the way that I think about this. I call this the virtuous customer centric cycle. Uh, the way to look at this diagram is start with the upper left-hand box. You want to build a culture where customer centric values drive your organization. That's point one. That's the way you motivate your employees. Those motivated employees then produce innovations and superior customer service. That leads to increased customer satisfaction, which leads to revenue growth increases, leads to profit growth. You reinvest, that leads to shareholder value. There are a lot of companies that miss the first two points. They think that you can invest in R&D and you will get product innovations and superior customer service, and then that will lead to increased customer satisfaction. It doesn't work that way. The, the example for me is the airline industry. The US airline industry has really low morale. Employees are not motivated. And yet these airlines expect superior customer service and customer satisfaction. They're not getting that. They're not getting superior customer satisfaction, uh, superior customer service. service and, and certainly customers are not happy uh, with, with the US airlines. Why? Because the first two boxes are not present. They're not customer centric values driven and they haven't motivated their employees. Okay, let me stop here and see if I can take a few questions uh, that you can type into chat. Okay. <clears throat> so there are a lot of questions over here. I mean, uh, would like to go through the chat directly or should I ask? I'm, I'm, I'm going through the chat. Okay, yes, so, so Ramesh, you said our traditional siloed organization structure is coming in the way of customer centricity. Yes. Do organizations need to relook at uh, KPIs in line? Absolutely right. So one of my colleagues here at, uh, at Harvard, Ranjay Gulati, uh, he's an organizational behavior professor. He's done some fantastic work on breaking down silos in order to become more customer centric. So uh, last name is Gulati, G-U-L-A-T-I. -A -A I would recommend you look up Ranjay Gulati and look at his work. Uh, culture eats strategy for breakfast, Rogers. Absolutely, absolutely right. Um, 
you know, you, you can have the best strategy, but if you don't have motivated employees, which comes from your culture, that strategy is not going to work. Um, so I don't know, uh, Sanjeev, I don't know the answer to why Ranbaxi collapsed. Uh, you will know, you will know more about that. I haven't done research on them. Um, digital transformation, Satish, this is a big, uh, big, big area. Uh, my fear is that people are focusing too much on the technology side of digital transformation and not enough on the customer side, the human side. We need to integrate humanity into digital transformation. Uh, how can a commodity-based company like a cement company be consumer-centric? Uh, Nikhil, uh, great question. You know, our research finds that there's no difference between B2B and B2C. In fact, the way that I indicate this is if you're in a B2B company like cement, you have to know the end customer, your end customer, and, and work backward from what your end customer wants. So every B2B company is a B2B2C company, if you think about it, right? Because that cement is to go, is to go into factory, building factories or building houses. You have to know what's happening at that end. Um, uh, okay, then um, let's see. Short-term, long-term conflict, yes. So, so here, here's, here's the issue. Remember I said in the beginning definition, uh, customer centricity is a long-term investment, not a short-term investment. So the companies, this is a journey. Uh, so, so one of the companies that I wrote case study about is, is uh, Citibank. Uh, Citibank is on a journey to become more client-centric or customer-centric. It doesn't show up in the, in, in the first quarter, the second quarter, it takes time. So you have got, actually got to track this journey. And that sometimes sets up conflict between the CFO and the CMO, means the chief financial officer and the chief marketing officer, because the chief financial officer is saying, I need, I need the financial results right away. And the chief marketing officer, no, this is an investment, not a cost. Customers interested in investment, not a cost. Don't treat it like an expense. We have to look at it for the, for the, for the, for the, long, for the long term. Okay, we're like a minute over. Um, Mr. Yadav, Professor Lagate, do you have any uh, wrap ups here? Yes, yes. Uh, there are so many questions which are popping up every time. Would you like to take one or two which had come in the beginning? Um, so would you stress customer retention over profit growth? Karthik, let me respond to this question. We can close the session. Karthik, with your, with your question. So, so great question. Remember I talked about loyalty of customers? You know, if you look at where your sales and marketing budget is going, you can say divide it up by customer acquisition, customer retention. Most companies spend six times as much on customer acquisition as they spend on customer retention. That's that's usually what we find on average, right? And that makes sense. You're doing cold calls, you're investing. So customer acquisition is very expensive. In the process of doing that, we tend to ignore our loyals. We are we're investing so much in acquisition that we forget about investing in retention. So I say, twist it around, turn it around. Turn your best customers into your sales force. What do I mean by that? Your loyal customers, get them to advocate for you. Get them to build business. Use word of mouth. Try to get referrals. This is particularly important for service businesses because what your clients or customers say is absolutely gold. Okay, all right. So let me conclude here and let me thank you for your patience and your comments uh, and your ideas and thoughts. And I hope that these points will be of use to you. Um, for all of you students that are here, um, I hope this is going to be helpful. And for all of you practitioners who are here, uh, this evening. I hope this is immediately useful to you. Uh, thank you again. And uh, Professor Lagate, thank you for the invitation to, uh, to close the loop and to come back to Bajaj Institute, uh, at least in this uh, virtual form until I can actually uh, be in Churchgate uh, in, in, in person, which hopefully will be, yes. will be soon as uh, yeah. vaccinations rise. We'll All the best. Here. All of you, please stay safe. Stay healthy. I know this is a difficult time, but this too shall pass. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Uh
May I request uh, Mr. Sripad Ranade, our executive committee member, to do the vote of thanks and then Kavita ma'am to make the next announcements? Uh, Thank you, Kiran. Uh, uh, on behalf of uh, the Bombay Management Association, uh, it's my distinct pleasure, first of all, Professor uh, Rohit Deshpande, for taking out time. And uh, it's morning for you, it's night for us. And uh, this was the best dinner we have had in a long time. So thank you so much. Uh, and uh, what what you told us was uh, really something beyond what we had expected to uh, listen to, to hear to, and uh, you spoke about the culture of customer centricity, speaking for the customer, who's speaking for the customer in your organization. That's something that uh, stuck with me. And looking at profit as an outcome and not as a goal. And that's something for all of us us to sleep over and think about. Um, so thanks to you uh, once again from Bombay Management Association. And uh, also thanks to our partners, GNIMS, who have made uh, today's event possible. Uh, we have here a very uh, diverse audience. So thanks to all the past presidents of BMA, the current committee members who are here, the secretariat who has worked very hard to get this event to happen, and all the members of BMA who have chosen to attend today. In addition, I would also like to thank everyone in the audience, whether they're professionals, academics, students, members of BMA, for staying here. Most of them after dinner, some of them yet to go for dinner and making this a special occasion for all of us. So thank you once again. Thank you, Professor Deshpande, for accepting our invitation. And uh, you're most welcome at uh, Churchgate whenever you are in India. We would request you to visit uh, JBIMS and Bombay Management Association, which is just nearby. In five minutes, we can read. And it was a great session. I'm sure all the young uh, students, executives, and all the um, senior professionals here in this audience have benefited by your uh, research and your thoughts that you have uh, given us. So before we stop, let me remind you that uh, on the YouTube BMA channel, please subscribe, go through our repository of over 175 uh, videos now, which are very, very interesting and very diverse. You can uh, go through them. Uh, coming up next, instead of Friday Fundamentals, this time we have Leader Speak series on Saturday morning at 9.30 a.m. And let me share with you the pamphlet. I hope it is visible. Uh, we will have uh, Mr. Rajneesh Jain, the CFO of Reliance uh, Geo, uh, will be talking as leader speak. On 11th Wednesday webinar, we have uh, demystifying coaching. On thir uh, 13th Friday, we have Dr. Surya Narayan Ayer. On 18th, Another BMA masterclass by Mr. Shriram Yogi. There is an insurance conclave and we have on 25th, celebrating Indian managers who made a difference in that series. We have episode on Sri Sharu Rangnekar and the month will be ended by Mr. Rahul Kalla talking about green businesses. I'm sure these are all interesting sessions that we are bringing it to you. Do join us on every Wednesdays and Fridays to enjoy the knowledge and experience that we provide to our members. Thank you so much. Good night to all those who are in India and to those who have joined from other parts of the world. Good day. Thank you.